Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode... 180 perspectives on parenting top challenges of parenting that's mm, not at all a, not it actually it's perspectives on parenting getting them ready okay whatever <laughs> hopefully you got the same script as me <laughs> i have the questions all right this is just from a couple of however long ago it was all right well Any, it'll, it'll be interesting if nothing else Anyway, I'm your host, Madison Whalen, uh, given a great intro so far, and uh, <laughs> my co-host today, Joseph Whalen. Hi. This is why I don't do this stuff anymore. A little out of practice. You only do this like, you know, every 10 episodes. And also our special guest for today, um, Michelle Whalen from Insights and Entertainment. Hi, do- Michelle. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> Sound like you know, a special guest. It's mom. <laughs> <laughs> we just had dinner. It wasn't like, you know, I haven't seen you in a while or anything. That's true. Well, it's been a while since we've been on the air, though. Well, yes, that is true. All right. So how's everybody doing? Fantastic. Wonderful. And you? A Good. Not not used to this, but we're working on it. And another year older. Yeah, that's... Yeah, look at that. Ain't that nifty, am I right? Pretty soon we're not going to be able to do Insights into Teens anymore. I still got a couple of years, technically. Well, that's good. So the show will continue for a little while. Till I'm 20, technically. Like I, I'm still a teenager at 19, technically. So That's true. 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 And then we'll have to go up and go out and dig out up another teenager that can be on the show. <laughs> Or we'll be lying. Well, technically, you started the show at 12, so. Right. Yeah, technically, we were lying from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> it's all a, a lot. A bunch of liars. <laughs> uh, anyway, so today we're going to be doing another one of our uh, perspectives on parenting. This is the uh, third episode of this we've done. It's kind of our, like, big episode, 10-episode uh, margin top top her off or like you know segue into the next era of what our insights into teens podcasts are going to be about kind of like a a season arc you know pretty much yeah and like you said earlier today we are going to be talking about a section from um that we've been pulling from so far for the other episodes which is getting them ready um so we're going to be going through various different questions relating to things of teaching kids to socialize, instilling good behavior in them, and looking after their educational needs. Um, Since I do not have the right thing up, I do not have a good summary, so that is my best interpretation of what we've got so far. That's good enough. All right. um, uh, But before we get started on the podcast, I'd like to invite the listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions listed under Insights into Teens. You can also find video and audio versions listed under Insights into Things. I'd also like like to invite you to give us your feedback on what we're talking about or give us your suggestions for show topics. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com and links to all these and more are on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? We are ready. All righty. So start. <laughs> Sorry, wrong button. 
Oh, we're just full of mistakes. I was almost ready. <laughs> <laughs> we're just full of mistakes today, aren't we're, we? A little out of practice. A little out of practice. It's been a while. Um, but starting us off, we're going to be talking. Ab- I'm going to be asking both of you questions about uh, teaching kids how to socialize. Uh, so I'm going to ask this to you, um, father. Okay. So, is it the job of a parent to teach their kids how to socialize? I, I don't know if it's the job of the parent. I think kids, for the most part, will socialize where they're comfortable. I think parents have the responsibility of kind of setting the example uh, and teaching kids the probably the cautious way to socialize, you know, the, the dangers of it, how to do it right, and and encouraging, I, I think that's probably a better term. Is it's it's a parent's job to encourage you to socialize, but within your comfort zone. I think. All right, that's fair, uh, Mommy. You want to add anything on that? No, I would probably uh, agree for the most part um, with that. I think you know nowadays you have a lot of uh, kids that do homeschooling, so. There's not as much socializing for for some people, but a lot of the homeschoolers actually have their own school system in some respects so that they can have the kids socialize. So back in the day, whenever you heard that somebody, you know, was homeschooled, it kind of meant that they didn't know how to act in public or didn't know how to act Uh, you know, with other people because they were never around other people where now homeschooled kids actually probably get more interaction because not only are they're in a different type of environment, so they are being able to to socialize more. So I think it, it is important to, you know, for the parents to make sure that their child is in some sort of environment to to be able to socialize. All right. Fair enough. I'll leave the next question uh, to you, Mommy. Uh, Do or do you not feel kids knowing how to socialize is important and why or why not? Oh, absolutely. It's very important because it's how you function, you know, day to day in in the world. Fortunately, uh, nowadays, so much can kind of be done in isolation Unfortunately, we we found that out during the pandemic that people didn't need to necessarily go to work. Now having all of the technology that you have where you could video call with somebody, FaceTime or Zoom or whatever, you don't need to necessarily physically socialize, but you still have some sort of skill set that you need to be able to to communicate and socialize even virtually. Um, so I think it's it's just important in general to be able to, you know, not have anxiety when you want to go get something to eat and you need to go order from a restaurant or pick something up at the store. There's all that social interaction. But there are times, you know, again, because of the pandemic and everything, there's so much that became uh, virtual or or curbside where you don't have to, where there are people that have the anxiety of of having the social interaction where it kind of helped them to still be kind of part of things without having it. But I think it's a skill set that everybody, you know, should, should have. Okay. Do not at all feel called out by that anyway. (laughs) Uh, I'll turn the next question over to you, father. Uh, <laughs> can kids gain enough social skills on their own through things like school and interacting with others with little parental influence? You know, if I'm going back to when I was a kid, I would say absolutely. My parents had very little influence on my social upbringing, I'd say. We you know, did it all of ourselves. You know, my parents, like my parents weren't the helicopter parents. They, they weren't hovering over me. They weren't, 
part of the PTA. They weren't the soccer moms. None of that stuff existed at the time. So as a kid, we did everything ourselves from a social standpoint. We got home from school. You know, if you had homework, you finish your homework. And then you were out playing until it was dark and you had to come in at that point in time. You did it through school because you made friends with everyone at school. And there was a very different environment at the time. Like you, unfortunately, nowadays, there there are too many things out there now that are a danger to kids. So parents tend to be overly protective these days. And as a result, you get the creation of play dates. You know, we didn't have play dates as a kid. If I wanted to hang out with my friends, I'd get on the phone, call and see if they were there. I'd go over to their house. You know, in the neighborhood that I lived in, it was a, it was a, not a gated community, but it was a closed community in, in, in that it wasn't on any major roads. So the, the whole house, the whole community itself was about one square mile. So if I wanted to hang out with my friends, I'd either go to my best friend who was on the next street over or I'd walk across town for five minutes to go to see the kids that were over there. So there was nothing that kept you in the house. We didn't have technology. We weren't glued to our phones or anything like that. So you had to go out and play with people and make friends because there was no substitute. You know, you had three channels on, on, you know, showing my age here, but <laughs> you had three channels on, on TV, unless you were rich enough to have cable and then you had like 15 channels. So there wasn't anything at home to do. You didn't have video games. You didn't have computers. When I was a kid, you had toys and you played with your friends with toys or you'd go out and play sports or something like that. So my parents had almost nothing to do with my socializing. So the fact that if, if it was up to my mom, I probably wouldn't have had any friends because she didn't let anybody over the house. Hmm. She hated having people over the house because she didn't want people making a mess at the house. So today it's very different though. And I think today there are so many things at, 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 at home that keep kids from being social. Ironically, social media is one of them. Hmm. You know, people think social media is a social activity and it's not. It's, it's the exact opposite. So as a result, parents today are organizing kids in, you know, play groups or whatever to try and get them to socialize more because we have to get you ready to interact with society as an adult. And then if, if you're not going to do it yourself, then the parents have to at least put some effort into that. That's fair enough. Uh, the next question goes to you, Mommy. Uh, what methods do you feel are best in getting kids to socialize? Well, I think it, it helps if there's some sort of common interest. So, you know, for kids to, to either join a sport or do dance or some sort of club, some sort of activity. I think that always helps because then you have that that common bond versus, hey, I'm into video games and I'm into baseball, but I don't like video games and I don't like baseball. You'll you might have a conflict and then it might make you actually not even want to to socialize. Um, so I think that's probably a, a good start. Um, you know, besides school, I think going to school or being, you know, with kids your own age is a great way to kind of start the socializing. And then if you see that there's some sort of, you know, issue where, you know, maybe they're not socializing enough, maybe uh, they're not getting along with people, maybe trying to find a group where, you know, they would kind of feel that that they belong. That makes sense. Do you want to weigh in on this, Daddy? No, I think Mommy covered that topic pretty well. All righty. Uh, next question goes to you, then. Uh, should certain social activities be limited to different age groups? If so, which ones? None come to mind immediately, but I'm sure there are certain ones that are age-appropriate. Certain things require certain resources. You know, if you want to go to the mall... The mall's only going to allow a certain age group to be there unsupervised. 
Um, if you want to go to the movies, you need transportation, you need money. So there's logistics around that, right? Mm -hmm. If you just want to hang out with your friends, no, that shouldn't be any, any age group. You're going to watch TV or play video games or play board games. So anything that's there probably would be age specific to the actual activity itself. And it would be less dependent on the socializing aspect of it than it would be what the actual activity I think would be. That makes sense. Um, anything to say on that? No, I think that was, that was okay. All right. Uh, mommy, the next question is for you. Okay. What kind of impact do you feel that you've had on my social life? Hmm. I don't know. I hope a positive, <laughs> positive one. Um, while you weren't in any sort of clubs or anything up until high school, um, you know, you did do the before and after care, which that was kind of, you know, not that it was necessarily a club. It was something that was needed because of, uh, you know, going in and working you know, in the office and, and the hours of school and, and things like that. But that kind of became a way for you to socialize with a vast array of, of kids that weren't necessarily all within your age group. You know, when you started, you were one of the younger kids and then you became, you know, the older kids. So you got to kind of see the transition of being the kid that, oh, I don't have that much homework. I want to go play. I want to go play to being the older kid that had more homework. And you got annoyed at <laughs> the younger kids who just wanted to play because you still had homework that you that you needed to do. Um, but I think you also kind of found your niche of, OK, I kind of like being the older kid and hanging with the the younger kids and kind of being the mom of the group in a way. I think that kind of became your 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 niche uh in a lot of cases cuz even with you know the kids in the neighborhood you're one of the older ones when you would get together and do stuff and you kind of organize and you're you're kind of like the kid wrangler. Come on, let's do this. Let's go here. You know, let's uh, do that. Or, you know, even when you were in marching band, you know, if somebody needed a Band-Aid, wait, I got one. Oh, you need a fan? You're hot. Yeah, here's that. Oh, y you were the one that, you know, was taking care of everybody. Um, so I think that kind of helped to, to put you in that. Um, I know I kind of look back and I, I kind of have regrets that we didn't get you more involved with things when you were younger. And unfortunately, it was time constraints where, you know, there were activities that started at, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon. But because of our, our working schedules, we couldn't do that. So you weren't able to do dance or brownies or Girl Scouts or or things like that. I like brownies. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? Um, so I kind of regret that. And I wonder how things would have changed if you had been able to do those things. Would you be, you know, different socially than you are now? That's fair. You know, but, you know, I, I don't think you have any regrets for it i don't think you ever go you know i really wish yeah you know, yeah not really no <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of you know you're kind of happy like being where you are and again i think part of it is also because we went through covid you know and that was a, a when you were in middle school so that was another like informative year time frame that kind of got compressed where that should have been more getting out, hanging out with friends, doing things, but nobody was doing any of that. But you have this nice little core group, you know, of friends, which is important, I think, to that everybody have that. So you might not always be able to get together with everybody, but it's like, all right, well, do you want to do something? All right, we'll do something this week, you know, and it's maybe not everybody all at once, 
but okay, so this day you hang out with this person and this day you, you get to hang out with that one. And, you know, so I feel, you know, that I kind of, all right, we, we did a good job. You know, she's not the person that's, you know, sitting at home, not talking to anybody, not communicating with anybody, not hanging out with anybody. So, you know, so we, we, I think we did, we did good so far. Fair enough. Just need to learn how to, you know, order food on your own. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. All right. So the next question is going to go out to you. So you mentioned before how um, a parent can kind of inf- how a parent can kind of influence a kid in the terms of them being social. So do you believe that a parent could cause a child to be less social? Yes. There are certainly a number of different ways that a parent can have that impact on a child. And and sometimes it's not a negative impact. Sometimes if you're someone who is more interested in going out and socializing than you are in doing the things that you need to be responsible about doing, schoolwork or chores or whatever, having a parent make you less social is a positive The negatives tend to come in with parents who live vicariously through their kids. And you see this a lot with sports. You know, you have parents who are, want to relive their youth through their kids. And so they get them in every sports event. They're doing traveling teams. They're doing tournaments, you know, and their entire life is consumed with going out and doing these sports, not because the kid really wants to do it, but because the parent wants to do it. And that's where it gets dangerous, you know, and that's where you kind of have to be careful. Yeah, you also mentioned the idea of helicopter parents. And do you think a helicopter parent could also cause a child to be less social in a more negative light? I I think a helicopter parent who's overly cautious um, and unfortunately, in today's society, it, it's not unjustified to be overly cautious of your children. But a helicopter parent could really put too much fear in their kids and transfer their own fear to their kids and have them make that be make them be less social as a result. So, yes, there's definitely that negative effect. So really, like, depending on what type of parent you can be, either you live vicariously through your kids, your helicopter parent, or there's some other combination of it, a parent can always cause a child to be less social in a positive light, but also in a more negative light. Absolutely. There's a lot of different examples of bad parents out there that can cause this type of problem to happen. You know, you have parents that that aren't involved at all with their kids. And as a result, their kids are overly social. They wind up getting into groups that are a bad influence on them. They wind up getting into substance abuse issues. And parents should be doing something about their kids, but they're not. And and they allow their kids to basically r- run free with, with no constraints on them at all. And that's not a good thing either. All right. Uh, final question in this section goes to you, Mommy. Are there right and wrong ways of teaching a kid how to be social, and what would you say they are? Well, yeah, there's, you know, I think you need to, you know, have your your child interact, you know, out in in the real world, um, you know, and not keep them, you know, at home all the time. And, you know, children should be, you know, seen and not heard, um, you know, because you see it time and time again where, you know, a parent has their child out, uh, you know, shopping or at a restaurant or what's so funny? Nothing. Okay. And they are totally misbehaving because they don't know how to act because, you know, the parent never took the child out in public. So the child has no idea how to act socially, like what's the right way, you know, to act where, you know, daddy and I, when you were a baby, you went out, you did things. If you cried, you know, we took care of it. Or, you know, there was really only one time ever that we actually left someplace because, 
you we couldn't get you to stop crying it was just you were upset about something you either didn't feel well or whatever and unfortunately you were a baby so you couldn't tell us what was wrong you know we did all the things we changed you we fed you we burped you we did this that you know all the we beat you we <laughs> No, we didn't do that. We put the um, pillow over your head. <laughs> no, we didn't do that either. But, you know, we went through all the things and it just got to the point. So we didn't want to be that parent where we were ruining everybody else's time. But then there were multiple times where we would go places and people would compliment us on how well behaved you were and how polite you were. And that was a testament to us raising you to be, you know, socially aware and a polite, well-behaved child. So there's there's right ways to do it and there's there's wrong way. And, you know, but then the parent themselves also have to be, uh, you know, a, a well-behaved person because some parents themselves aren't, uh, you know, well-behaved. So it's kind of hard to teach your child how to be well-behaved if you don't know how to behave. Yeah, I think I think one of the keys is that the parents have to be socially um, competent. If the parents aren't socially competent and the child's being raised by parents who have no social skills, the child's not going to get any social skills because – one, there's no one to set the example, and two, there's no perceived need to have them in the first place. That makes sense. So that's one of the one of the I think overriding factors of that. All right, I think this segment went well. I think it did as well. All right, we'll take a quick break, and then we'll move on to the next segment. Okay. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today, we're on our perspectives on parenting. We're talking about getting them ready. And now I'm going to ask some questions about instilling good behavior in them. Them being children, by the way. <laughs> All right. Uh, our fir- to start us off with the first question, uh, we'll go to you, uh, Dad. So what forms... I've been demoted from father. <laughs> <laughs> So, what forms of good behavior should a parent try to instill in their child? Uh, yeah, without getting overly verbose, I think the basics. You want your kids to be honest. You want your kids to be hardworking. And you want your kids to treat other people decent. I, I think if you can get those three you know, qualities instilled in your kids, everything else kind of falls in line at that point in time. And keep your expectations realistic. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna turn your kid into a philanthropic genius overnight. But you have to demonstrate to them these these skills and these qualities. You have to be honest. You have to treat them with respect and make sure that you're kind to them and kind to others. You know, one of the one of the things that my mother always instilled in me was her compassion. She had this overwhelming compassion. For everyone. There wasn't anyone my mother ever turned away who needed help. We might not have had enough food on the table for the family, 
But if somebody needed help and she could take somebody in and give them a roof over their head and, and a warm meal and get them back on their feet, she would do it in an instant. And, and that leaves a lasting impression on kids when you see your parents act in noble ways like that, I think. That makes sense. Any other traits you'd like to add or you think he kind of covered no, it? No, I would say just raise your kids to be decent human beings. That's, I think, you know, if you... If they're human beings. Well... You know, for the aliens out there, the we don't we don't want to discriminate. Right. Yeah. But I, I think that's that's the, the top level. You know, if you raise them to be a decent human being, everything else kind of just falls, fall, into place. falls into place. All right. That's fair. Uh, turning it over to you, Mommy. Okay. Uh, how do you feel the actions of the parent can affect how good-natured or well-behaved their child is? Well, I, th I think that that comes into play where you're setting that example. If Daddy and I are, you, you see that we are, you know, walking down the street and we see somebody that's homeless and we're like, ah, screw them and, blah, 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 you know, and we, you know, kick over their cup or something and we're all jerky or whatever. Well, you're going to be like, all right, well, I have to be a jerk to everybody. Or in some cases, maybe that would even make you not want to be like that because you realize that's the bad example. But I think when you see, you know, hopefully the, the good example that the parents are setting, that that makes the child want to set that good example. But then again, you know, you have parents that go out of their way to have good examples, but the child just doesn't see it or has some s sort of issue where, nope, I'm not going to be like that. I want to be the exact opposite of my parents. So uh, as parents, you kind of hope for the best that you do enough to show what's right and wrong enough for your child to make that own you know, their own decision. Yeah, because you can't always guarantee that the kid's going to really even be listening to your example or doing the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are just rotten to the core and you, you can't right. get past that. Right. Fair enough. All right, turning this over to you, Daddy. Um, it is this something that can be entrusted by outside forces like school or peers to be taught to kids? I don't, I, yes, it can in so much as these types of behaviors can be instilled through discipline. Um, and you can even go so far as to say the military, you know, you've got a lot of kids that come out of high school who don't know who they are, don't know what they want to be. And they're, they're wild and dangerous and they wind up in the military and the military puts, gives them that, that discipline, that structure that they need because they might not be getting it at home. So yes, there's a place that schools can serve as a tool to that end. Is it their responsibility? Should parents abdicate their responsibility to, to the schools to do that? Absolutely not. This type of, of behavior, behavioral training or learning has to happen at home. And when parents forego that and parents decide that, that they're not responsible for teaching their kids how to behave properly, then you run into all kinds of societal problems. And the kids run into all kinds of, you know, disciplinary problems, academic problems, legal problems. And I think that's where a good portion, and I, and I hate to put all the blame on the parents, but I think a lot of the crime that you have in society today, a lot of the cruelty and the hatred that you see in today's society, I, I, I want to put that blame on parents because I think if you had better parenting, better mentoring at home, and parents who took the time and exercised the responsibility to raise your kids right, society would be a better place today. 
Um, all too often, we want to abdicate that responsibility and say, well, the school system should do that. Or the government should do it. Or go into the military. We're going to send you to the military. No, you need to be a good parent. It, it's That's really what it boils down to. And a good parent's primary concern is, one, protect your children, and two, make sure they become productive citizens in society. And if you can't make sure those two things happen, then you failed as a parent. Now, sometimes protecting your kid is hard to do in today's society because of people who have failed the system. But no one has any excuse for not raising your kids right. You can go through the motions and like like we said, you know, the kids might not take it and they just might be rotten to the core. There are literally people out there that are just bad people. But if the parents didn't put the effort in, you can't blame the child. You have to blame the parents at that point. So I can't say that that schools are responsible for this. Schools can do this. Your peers can do this. Peers become mentors, you know, as you as you grow older. So they can do it. And they should, to a certain extent, do it because it's the right thing to do. But ultimately, it has to start with the parents. That's understandable. All right, the next question is for you, Mommy. In what ways can a parent instill both good and bad behaviors in children? Well, I think that's by whatever example you're you're showing your child. Kind of the whole, if you go out to a restaurant and you totally become a Karen in you know, I want to see the manager and this is horrible and, you know, and you're constantly complaining because nothing is is done right when you're going over and above and, and showing that to your child, your child's going to see them and think either, oh, this is the way I have to be. I have to be a jerk in order to get what I want. Or your child might say, you know what, that was really kind of kind of wrong. Maybe I shouldn't be like that. So you always hope for for the best. But I think also showing, you know, the right example, hey, if something went wrong, this is the way you take care of it. You don't just go off the handle like that or, you know, how to deal with anger or how to deal with something that goes wrong and, uh, you know, so that you don't have that anxiety or the issues uh, of of having th- that bad behavior learned. You know, you kind of go, OK, this is how I deal with it and I move on and everything I- is better. So but then there are parents that they think <laughs> the way that they're raising their kids is right when other parents would look at them and go, no, you shouldn't be that way. You shouldn't be like that. You know, that's that's one of the things where kids don't learn how to be a bully from other kids. They learn it from, you know, other adults that then those kids would learn it from that. You know, you, you don't have the kids sitting around and, and a kid just decides to say something mean to somebody else. They said it because they heard somebody older or saw it on TV or something. So the parents need to kind of teach, you know, okay, this is the right way to do it. This is the wrong way to do it. And again, it kind of goes back to, you know, the schools and things like that where, yes, it's not the school's responsibility. The parents have to set that foundation. But the other part of it, too, is when you think about how many hours a day you're in school, you're actually in school and with those people longer than you are with your own family. So while it's it's almost like um, a, 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 a co-op, of, of sorts. You have to have the help from the school, not saying that it's their a hundred percent their responsibility. But again, if you if the parents lay that foundation, then everything else builds up from it. Kind of like, you know, if I teach you to be a decent human being, everything else should come, you know, come naturally and should be uh, you know, teaching you everything. Oh, okay, well, if I think, all right, 
decent human being, would I do this or would I do this? No, this makes sense. Doing that would be the bad thing. And hopefully then it kind of makes the, the rest of the, the lessons go, go smoothly. That makes sense. All right, next question is for you, Father. Oh, I get promoted Father. again. <laughs> so is teaching... Mr. Whale, this question is for you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <That's next. laughs> anyway. Uh, is teaching nothing about good or bad behaviors to children something to make a deal over or not? Um, that's a tough question. There are, there's an argument to be made to curb what you're teaching your kids when it comes to certain things. You don't, kids are developing, their brains are still developing. So if you impose your fears on kids and you try to teach them about some of the terrible things that happen, and, you know, talk about current events now. You, you've got the, the, the war in Gaza right now. Uh, you've got the war in Ukraine. There's a lot of things. The COVID experience. There's a lot of serious things that go on in the world that are anxiety-inducing. And while you want kids to learn from these things and, and mature from them and take something positive away from them, in trying to get to that positive outcome, you can very easily overwhelm a kid's senses and you can very easily scare them and, and scar them with the imagery that you see on TV and the repeated um, uh, atrocities that are happening. So when it comes to stuff like that, there's an argument to be made to tone it down. You know, not, not do away with it entirely because kids are going to see this stuff on the news. They're going to hear about it. Their friends are going to talk about it and they're going to have questions and they're going to need guidance to understand what these things mean and how it affects them and so forth. But you don't want to throw them, you know, into the fire and give them everything. So there's a certain level of um, discretion, I think, that's involved in that that parents really need to understand their kids. And this is, this is part of going back and being a good parent. It's not just about setting an example. It's about understanding the audience. And it's about knowing what kind of message is best received and sometimes dwelling on some of the negative things or even being overly optimistic sets the wrong tone. So I think parents have to understand their kids. You have to respect your kids and, and you have to talk to your kids. Every kid is different. And the only way you're going to know how to present information and lessons to your kid is to get to know them. And sometimes that requires a certain amount of discretion to make sure that you're not oversaturating them with Positive or negative, I think. That's fair. All right. Uh, for a bit of personal experience, Mommy, what have you done to instill good behaviors in me? <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> I locked you in a closet. No. <laughs> what didn't you do? I don't know. What didn't I do? Uh, I think the beatings will continue until, until your morale improves. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, for the most part, you were a really good kid. You're you're still a good kid. Like <laughs> we haven't. We never really went through. Like, I can look back at so far in the last 17 years, and there really hasn't been the, oh, my God, do you remember this time when, you know, I do. whatever. Yeah, I remember. I, but I, I, I don't. I don't know if it's because I have blocked it out. Like, am I not remembering things? I, you know, like, obviously we had ups and downs 
especially going like everybody going through puberty, you know, your emotions go out of whack and, but because we talk about it and I think that's, that's actually been very helpful. I think the fact that we have this understanding between all of us for the most part, you know, there are obviously things that you don't want to talk to daddy about because it's, you know, a girl thing, a female thing, you know. And daddy's very grateful more, for that. Too, right? in a way. Or you're more empathetic than him. Right. Or that, that I'm too. I'm empathetic. Not always. Mm. Well, sure, we'll go with that. Um, but I, I think because we've always had that open communication where daddy knows a whole lot more about female reproduction than he ever wanted to learn (laughs) and i but i think that was helpful it wasn't well go and talk to your mother about this i don't want to know about this you know and i think that also helped so when the mood swings hit he Dad, understood. Daddy knew to bring chocolate home those and, days. <laughs> right. And when you when when you brought chocolate home, everything was right with the world. And it was like, oh you know. So that's probably been, you know, our our biggest hurdle in terms of that. The other, you know, thing is, you know, schoolwork and school grades and and the the biggest hurdle there is getting you to believe in yourself, really. We're not there yet, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, we're discussing that in a minute, so we can hold off on that for the time but being. But I, I think it's just, you know, it, it's been, you know, there's always that little hurdle that we have, but we talk things out, and I think that's the biggest thing is that we talk about it and we communicate. And if it's something, I don't want to talk about it now. Okay, we don't talk about it now, but we'll talk about it later. And we talk things through, and and sometimes it doesn't make sense when we're talking about it, but then it's kind of like you have that uh, uh, epiphany of, oh, okay, this kind of makes sense now. All right, I see your point. Or I don't really believe what you're saying, but it does make sense. And hopefully at some point I'll I'll believe you, you know, that you say, you know, what it is. And I think you, you realize that we have your best interest at heart. We want you to succeed. And, and whatever we, you know, can do for you, we, we will. All right. I think... That's, you know, solid. Thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I don't know. I'm, get, I'm, I'm starting to lose it. <laughs> sorry. All right. So uh, the last question we'll go over for this segment, uh, leading towards you, Father. Mr. Whalen. <laughs> Mr. Whalen. Um, do you feel instilling good behavior in kids is a more difficult task for certain parents? Um. Yes. There are parents who don't exhibit the behavior that they want their kids to exhibit. And when that happens, the parents come across as hypocrites. <clears throat> my parent, my father was that way. My father expected a certain level of behavior if you were out in public or if you were at home with family. And my father expected respect. He was big on demanding respect. And unfortunately you can't demand respect. Respect is something that's earned. And the way that my father treated us was on a level, several levels below where he treated perfect strangers. And as a result, there was very little respect that I could have for him. So when that sort of expectation is there and you as a parent can't deliver on it yourself, it's very difficult for that parent to dictate how you should behave. That's why I think the most important lesson are lessons your parents teach you through their example. If your parents are decent people, if they're respectful, if they have pride in you, and self-confidence in you, 
those things transfer down to you. Unfortunately, so do their negative traits. If your parents lack ambition or if they're lazy or if they're disrespectful or they insult people or they're negative, those, those traits transfer down to the kids as well. So I think a parent can't demand or expect any more of their kid than they're willing to do themselves because the kid's not going to respect you at that point in time. And if anything, that's going to cause your kids to, to rebel against you. And that in and of itself is a lesson. That is fair. I think that was a good way to end this. All right. So uh, we will be back after a short break. And when we do, we're going to be talking about looking after your kids' educational needs. All righty. We'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Uh, today on Perspectives on Parenting, we're looking at getting them ready. And now we're going to talk about looking after your kids' educational needs. Uh, so to keep with the order, Mommy, uh, the first question is for you. Okay. So what do you feel are some of the most important educational needs of a child? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> Um, making sure that they get a good education is probably the, the biggest thing. Obviously, everybody learns differently, so you have to make sure that your child is in an environment where they can excel. I think any child can excel. It just is a matter of are they being taught the right way? Because everybody learns different ways. Um, so what works for one child might not work for another child. Um, so I think that's that's a big thing is, is knowing where your child's limitations are, what do they excel in, what do they need help in, and to try and help them navigate that so that they can succeed. All right. That's fair. Want to comment on any of that? Nope. I think she's spot on there. Woohoo! All righty. Right um, answer. Next question is for you then. Uh, should there be a line between what parents have to teach their kids and what they should learn in school? Something I feel like, you know, is kind of put in question a lot in the modern uh, day. So. Oh, well, absolutely. And I, and I think my take on it is parents should teach their kids wisdom and schools should teach the kids knowledge. So you learn book knowledge and your maths, your sciences, your uh, languages, all that comes from school. And I'm perfectly fine with that. How to use that now, how to use that knowledge is what w is wisdom, right? So then your parents teach you that. How to how to utilize the abilities that you gain from school, when to utilize them, and how best to put them to use that benefits society. That's what your parents should be teaching you to do. I think schools can't do that. And schools can't do that because school's job is not to do that. School's job is to dump knowledge into you teach you the subjects. 
And when schools try to teach you the moral side of those things, that's where they run in the problems. Because schools are, are, are institutions of the state. And the state itself is, by its very nature, biased. I think parents who it's their responsibility to raise productive members of society should be the ones that are teaching their kids how to use that knowledge and how to interact in society. While schools can maintain the control of that knowledge and teaching of that knowledge with the oversight of parents. Parents should have control over the knowledge that you get. You know, you should, parents shouldn't abdicate teaching kids about history. And I'm talking real history, not watered down history that make people uncomfortable. You know, history is history and, and that's what you should be taught, even if some of the subjects may be sensitive or uncomfortable or may not hold a certain light to individuals or institutions in this country. It's history and it's worth learning. You know, your sciences are the same thing. Let the, te let the parents be the ones to teach kids the intricacies of how that knowledge is then used for the betterment of society and keep the schools out of the raising of the kids. They should be the teaching the kids. All right. I definitely think that's fair. So this question kind of goes along with that. And despite that we haven't gotten entirely your opinion um, on the full matter, I still think it would be good to get uh, part of your perspective on this, Mommy. So due to more neglectful or restrictive parenting, should schools be required to teach a bit more about sensitive topics? Well, I think... <sighs> Well, I don't think it's the school's responsibility. It's someone's responsibility. And I think that's where you kind of have to, you know, let, par let the school kind of gauge where, you know, something might be lacking and where you know, a teacher should reach out to the parent saying, hey, did you know such and such was going on with your child? Because in some cases, the parent might not know because, you know, maybe when the, the child is at home, they act, you know, one way, but yet when they go to school, they're a completely different person. Um, and especially if it's a bad behavior or or something uh, along those lines um so you know again they're going to school to to learn and to to get that knowledge but again like i had said kids are in school far more hours than they are at, at home you know during the the week um, you know, and then, of course, if you have parents that are are divorced, where then their time is even more split between, you know, different parents or whatever the, the parents work schedule might be. So. I don't want to say that, you know, the school needs to be surrogate parents, but again, it's a cooperative between you know, the school or whatever education or if it's a club or something that, um, you know, a child is involved with. Hopefully there's some sort of advisor that is seeing something that maybe the parent's not seeing, that they can at least bring it to the parent's attention and say, hey, listen, we realize, you know, this is going on. Did you even know about it? Do you even, you know, realize that th this is an issue um, and and kind of go go from there. That's fair. All right, turning it over to you, Mr. Whalen. <laughs> um, do teens' educational needs include more than just academics? Uh, absolutely, and I think we've we touched on I think one of the most significant aspects of this when we talked about socializing and social skills in the in the first segment. Socializing isn't something that's in a book, right? You don't you don't take a course on how to be social. Social interactions happen as a 
byproduct of being in a school with multiple kids and adults who are your teachers or your counselors or stuff. So there's more that happens. There's more information and knowledge that's imbued on you than is what's in the textbooks. So yes, I absolutely agree with that. And you can take that a step past that to nutrition and physical education, the, you know, the basic health understandings, you know, learning your information to, to learn to drive, you know, stuff like that. There's, there's so much that happens in school that's not just academic related that's important for kids' growth. Um, creativity is another one. You know, even though it's considered an academic activity, your ability to express yourself creatively is something that's nurtured in school that's really not an academic. You don't get graded on whether or not you can draw a, a pretty picture or not, but your ability to express yourself through that way is something that's nurtured in school as well. So definitely more than just academics. All right. Uh, we'll move the next question to you, Mommy. Um, so what topics do you feel schools need to prioritize more or add to get kids ready for the real world? Well, I think now, you know, a class that you'll actually have later this this year, uh, your personal finance class, that was something that we never had in uh, high school, really, I think unless you were a, a business major or, you know, t taking business classes is how do you even balance a checkbook? How do I pay bills? How do I, you know, get car insurance? These are things that, you know, you're going to need to to learn how to do. Um, I'm kind of, uh, you know, the one one thing I, I I kind of wish you did have was I know when I was in middle school and we started having these electives and things, home ec was one of them. It was basic cooking, basic sewing. We also did wood shop uh, and and other things. Um, so you kind of got a little taste of that. And that was something where now, if you wanted to take a cooking class, you could, but with all of your other classes that you you have, uh, you know, for engineering and stuff, you, you don't have that space available. But I think something like that should be uh, something that, that's taught. Uh, just basic, you know, uh, everyday survival of, um, you know, how to do the laundry and things like that. Not necessarily that it needs to be a class, because again, that should be something, that, you know, that's done at home. But I think if your parents aren't ones that like to cook or know how to cook, I think if you were in an environment with your friends on how to cook, you'd have more fun learning it where you know there are some people that that have fun cooking with their family if their family likes to cook there are some you know families that don't don't like to cook um or have relatives that that do cook so i i think that would be something i'm surprised they've gotten away from that and added all these other things because the other thing too is while it's great that you can end up graduating high school and have all of these college credits. There are some kids that, you know, end up having like double majors in, in high school now where they're graduating high school already with an associates. And it's like, okay, so now what do you do? You're, you're still only 18 years old. You still have a lot of learning to, to still do what's that piece of paper going to do? Are you really ready for the the real world? Maybe you are, maybe you're not. Um, so I think in some cases, there's more pressure on kids your age than when, you know, daddy and I went to school. Um, but yet I think also you guys have more advantages because there's more information out there. But I think in a lot of cases, it's almost information overload, too. Um, so it's kind of like a double-edged sword where, 
you have it better in some cases, but I think you're kind of lacking in others because there's so much more out there to do. You know, like some of the classes you're taking are things that I took, I couldn't take until college. And it's funny because I remember having this same conversation with my parents when I was in eighth grade and what I was learning, they didn't learn until college as well. And I was actually using their college textbook to help me with a report. So it's, you know, I get to now see that kind of full circle of, oh, well, back in my day, I didn't do that until I went to college or I went to a trade school. And now it's, oh, I'm doing that in seventh grade. So, yeah, so I think that's kind of where, uh, you know, again, double-edged sword. I think there's a lot that should be taught, but then there's a lot that you're being taught that somebody would have had to go to college for. So. Fair enough. All right, now we get to the college questions. Awesome. Dun, 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 Oh, sorry. All right, first of them goes to you, Daddy. Um, should parents be- I don't be- know who I'm going to be by the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> So should parents be the ones fully responsible for sending their kids to college? Absolutely not. Somebody else should pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> and if so, who? <laughs> uh, Please write us a check. No, and you know what? It's funny. The, I was thinking about this question. The, the college boards agree. And that's why the college boards don't just look at your academic transcript. They look at the clubs that you're in. They look at the charity work that you do they look at uh, they look at who you are they try to look at who you are as a person they look at personality they look at at everything and the person that you become isn't the person that you are on your test score sheets on your on your uh cve or cv cv it's the person who is in that after school club or the person who volunteers at the soup kitchen or at the animal shelter. These are all the various different things that help you get to college and put you through college. Now, that's just talking about the personality and the the morality, the, the, the character development side of things. But outside of that, from a financial standpoint, there's tons of different things that you – that can help you financially get through college and get to college. The parents shouldn't think that the burden is all on their own to send you to college, keep you in college, and buy your books and all that. There's a lot of help that's out there, and a lot of that comes from you, too. A lot of it comes from your academic achievements. You know, the the higher you score on on your academic efforts, the easier it is to get financial aid. So you're helping to pay part of your college just from your performance. It's not just the the parents. I think the parents have a large role in it. Um, I think I look at it from a, from a strictly dollar and cent standpoint. If you look at it that way, it's an investment. Your parents getting you to college and getting you through college is an investment for your future. And if there's one thing that parents want for their kids, it's for them to be successful. And whatever you do, whatever you choose to go to college for, whatever you choose to do in life afterwards, even if you choose not to go to college, mommy and daddy want you to be successful and we want you to be happy. And, you know, success lends itself to to happiness. Um. So it's an investment there, but it's also the community who helped to build you into that person that makes you successful. We can't take credit for it. The majority of the effort comes from your part, but there's a lot of guidance. There's a lot of help along the way. Some of that comes from friends. It comes from your your peers. It comes from mentors that you're going to be associated with. You know, you're taking a trip to Japan. That trip to Japan, very few kids are going to take that trip before they get out of high school. You're going to learn 
a ton, not just about Japan, but about life. You're going to learn about travel. You're going to learn a, about um, finance. You've already learned about finance because you've had to finance a, a portion of that trip. All these things are what get you to college. And I'm not just talking financially. I'm talking knowledge-wise. And these are things that are going to serve you through college and after college, through life. So, no, it's not just the parents. There's a lot of factors that go into your success moving forward, not the least of which is your own. All right. Fair enough. You get the big one, Mommy. No oh boy. So, let's uh, get this one out of the way. It's covered. It's co uh, And I'm already flubbing it. <laughs> Great. Is college inherently necessary for someone to live a successful life? No. Okay, moving right <laughs> along. Hey! <laughs> college is not for everybody. That it's... While it's... You know, again, back in the day, you had the people that went to college and the people that didn't. And depending on what your test scores were, you were either a college prep or you weren't. That was how it was back, you know, when, when I was in school. Depending on what your grades were, oh, you're going to college. Okay. Or, okay, so if you're not going to college, then what are you doing? Are you going into the military or are you going and working at the gas station? It was, you know, almost like an insult to the person that didn't go to college. And, and sometimes the person wasn't going to college because of financial reasons, because it was just too expensive to, to do that. Um, so if it's, you have to want to do it, you know, there are kids that their parents tell them you're going to college, whether you like it or not. And then that, kid ends up in college for 10 years because they go to school and they don't know what they want to major in so they major in one thing and they do that for a couple of years and they don't like that and they move on to something else and you get that professional student where they just keep getting more and more degrees because they don't want to go into the real world they just rather stay um i think nowadays there's so many technical schools out there uh, where that might be better suited for, uh, you know, for a student or for, for a child to, to go into that aspect. You have to do what you want to do. If it's something where you want to be in the medical field, you want to, to work in that, then you have to go to college. Unless you want to be a medical tech, then you would go to you know, a technical school that deals with that. You know, you want to be a lawyer. Well, you have to go to law school. Then you have to go to college. You know, depending on what it is that you want to do, then there's a certain path that you have to follow. If it's something where you're not sure, should you still go to college? Well, maybe. Maybe that's where you decide to kind of stay more local. Maybe you decide to go for an associate's degree where you go to a, a community college and kind of test the waters and see what it is that that you like. And and that's where I think nowadays high school has kind of become almost that precursor to, to um, having these choice schools and having these academies or these majors that you can have in in high school where you can kind of test the waters and see, ooh, do I want to do a career in music? Do I want to do a career in nursing? Do I want to do a career in business? And you start taking these classes and you realize, wow, I really hate this. Or do you want to do a career in truck driving? <laughs> or do you want to be a truck driver? That's, you know, a noble career as well. You have to do what makes you comfortable, what, ma you know, like daddy said, what makes you happy where you feel you're going to be successful. And success is based on what you feel. You might only make, 
you know, $50,000 a year, but you're completely happy. Where you could be making $100,000 a year and you're completely miserable. It's all a matter of perspective. So you have to do, you know, what makes you happy. Maybe working in that corporate environment makes you absolutely miserable. So you don't want to do it. But, you know, working in, uh, you know, uh, a, a clinic, you know, a, a veterinary clinic or something, you know, as a, as a as a technician makes you happy. You're not making as much money, but you're happy. You go home at the end of the day feeling fulfilled. That's what, you know, you, you have to figure out what will make you happy, what do you feel will be successful and what path do you need to get there? Is it college? Is it engineering? Is it music? Is it art? Is it computer science? What is it that, that brings you joy? That's, that's really kind of the, the main thing that you have to, to look at. Um, and, and then just kind of go from there. All right, I'm not going to ask you if college is right for me. Uh, we're not going to go down that path yes, today. Yes, you are going to college whether you like it or not. No. Okay. No, well. and we and no, seriously, we've we've had this discussion. We had, you know, kind of the precursor to this discussion when it came to National Honor Society. I'm just saying <laughs> this is where we we talked about it and you were very adamant that you didn't want to do it. You probably could have gotten in if you had applied and and you were asked to apply. You got the invitation to apply and you chose not to. That was your decision. We we did negotiate at least two years of college. Right. Just for the record. Right. And we did say... You know, and and that's because we felt because of where your grades are, we know you're going to get into a four year school. There's there's no question about it. And that's the other thing, too, is nowadays there's a college out there for everybody. Now you can go even truck drivers. Yeah, I'm sure there is. (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised. You can go anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, and there is a college available. If you want to do a virtual school, there are tons of virtual schools out there. So if you never want to set foot on a campus somewhere, you still have the ability to take classes and get a degree. Because again, the world has changed in the last 10, 15 years, and it's so much more accessible to, to do that. You know, if it's something where we start visiting colleges and there's nothing that sparks any sort of joy in you where you're like, "Eh, nope, 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 nope. We're not going to force you to go to Pennsylvania, to go to North Jersey, to go to Delaware, to go to Virginia, to go to Florida, you know, for school. That's where we had said, well, then stay local and at least get that associate's degree, and then let's see where you are. So this way you can say, you know what? I tried it. I did it. You know, what have we always said growing up? At least try something once, and if you don't like it, you never have to do it again. And that's kind of where we've kind of decided, you know, with college. and, And that might be a conversation that other kids need to have with their parents because their parents might be setting these grand expectations for their kids when if they just actually sat and had the conversation with their child, they'd realize that's not what I want to go and do. I want to do this. And then, you know, it, 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 everybody's happy that way. All righty. All righty. You look very happy now. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. uh, Hopefully this one will be, this is the last question we've got. And honestly, I think it's, it's uh, set up right uh, for you to answer it. So personal one again, uh, how do you help uh, provide me with my educational needs? 
I do absolutely nothing. And like it. And like it. No, uh, encouragement. You know, I think that's the biggest thing. Be there for your kids. Uh, we study a lot. Uh, we try to find the, the best study technique that works for you. And we'll try one way. If you don't get the scores you want, we'll try a different way. And, and you know, I try to get you excited. I try to get you interested in things. I think when you're interested in the subjects that you have, and, and granted, the period in history that you're doing right now, it's very difficult to get interested in. You have to have some 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 vested interest in it. And one of the things I try to do is make it interesting, make it fun. You know, we, we study for your chemistry. We try to make that fun. You know, I'll find videos that, that show a little bit extra or give you a little bit more background on some of the historic stuff that we do. Uh, I won't touch math with a 10 foot pole though. That's not my area of expertise. So that's all you. We figured that out. Yeah. I mean, what, what do I do? I, I try to make it interesting. I try to keep you, you know, focused on it. I, I try to not make it a grind. And I think a, a lot of kids run into the situation where school can be a grind. It gets boring. It's topics you don't want to talk about. And I think if parents can, can pique their kids' interests, can first of all notice that, that kids are zoning out or that they're not interested in, in what they're talking about, and encourage your kids. I think that's the biggest thing. You know, my 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 parents were very hands off when it came to school unless I brought home bad grades and then they yelled at me. And I think that's the wrong approach. Yep. Parents need to get involved with their kids before there's a need to yell at them. Because if there's a need to yell at your kids, it's probably because you haven't been involved with them. So get involved with them, um, encourage them and, and try to make it a little bit more entertaining. That's all I got. All right. That's fair. Uh, that's all we had for today. So did you want to do a quick break and then we'll come back with uh, closing remarks and You steps? got it. Here we go. All right. So uh, this was the end of our supposed to be one uh, episode um, segment on, uh, you know, top challenges of parenting. Uh, overestimated how long uh, the answers were specifically, but parenting's really hard. We had, <laughs> had to do a number of set and number of episodes. But hey, you know, I think we got the most out of it because you know we were still able to get to everything. So um, now we can get into some of the more uh, interesting topics um, outside of this for our next ones. Although that's going to be obviously a while from here. All right. Um, but thank you both for joining me. Thank you, um, for me. thank you for having me too. No problem. Now that Mr. I know the, now that I know my twelve names. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Um uh so you know, thank you for joining us. Uh and before we uh go completely, I'd like to uh give us a bit of uh start uh, our show plugs. So when it comes to our subscriptions, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and really anywhere you can get a podcast. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter or X, whatever you really go by at this point, at insights underscore things. Uh, we have uh, high-res vi videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insightsintothings. We stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things you can find audio versions of this podcast listed as podcast.insightsintoteens.com we're on facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast we're on instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things and you can find links to all these and more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com and that is it that's it another one in the books bye everyone bye bye